This video is uh, the first part of a three-part series intended to help you learn how to use the JET-10 aircraft modeling and analysis software. By first demonstrating how to use the software to analyze a historical aircraft design problem and then uh, showing how to use that uh, software to optimize that historical aircraft for a particular design mission and then do some trade studies with it. In this first part we're going to look at the original uh, requirements specified for the advanced tactical fighter which uh, produced the F-22 and how those requirements were modified uh, after uh, plotting them in constraint analysis. So here we have JET uh, 10 uh, with a geometry model of the YF-22 one of the two prototypes produced uh, for the advanced tactical fighter uh, program and the one that eventually won that competition. The uh, aircraft parameters that describe the aircraft are shown here on the left side of the screen and the uh, aircraft three view drawing is shown above them. In the center of the screen uh, and the top is the aerodynamic uh, and stability analysis results. Below that uh, on the left is a thrust and drag curve uh, plot for a particular altitude and to its right is a weight analysis of the aircraft. And then down below is the mission analysis. Over here in the upper right is the constraint analysis and that's what we're going to focus on here as we talk about uh, what the Air Force originally asked for for the F-22 and what they eventually got. So the, the initial requirements specified uh, back in the late 80s was, uh, were different from the ones that were eventually settled on. In particular, the supercruise Mach number was uh, 1.8 rather than uh, 1.5, which is what they eventually got. Uh, so we can model the difference that makes in our constraint analysis by changing uh, the cell here for the cruise, the mill power cruise, changing the Mach number from 1.5 to 1.8. So let's do that. And when we hit enter, let's watch what happens down here to the constraint diagram. The constraint of interest is this blue line here, and so we expect that thing to jump. So I'm going to hit enter. And sure enough, it jumps up quite a bit, the higher uh, cruise, uh, super cruise Mach number, uh, makes that a much more stringent requirement. Uh, another requirement that the Air Force had initially was for uh, the ability to sustain 5.2 Gs at 30,000 feet at Mach 0.9. And so we can uh, make that change as well to the combat turn constraint. That's this orange line here, and watch what happens when we do that. All right, so now the design point to meet those two more stringent constraints is far different from the design point uh, of the F-22 in the first place. And uh, the if you notice, the thrust to weight ratio required uh, is somewhere up around uh, 1.7 or something like that. Uh, the F-22 ended up being a 64,000 pound airplane. To get a thrust to weight of 1.7 would have required some very, very powerful engines. But in doing that, the airplane would have grown in weight as well. We know that from the behavior of the sizing equation. In fact, the sizing equation results, which are shown right here, say that the aircraft wouldn't close. The solution is a negative number, which says that uh, the aircraft could not be uh, built with those requirements, with the technology of the time. But there was even more stringent requirement that uh, the Air Force was originally asking for. At the time, the F-22 was being designed to uh, participate in a war in Europe. And the presumption for that war is that all the runways would be attacked and that uh, the rapid runway repair teams at best would be able to give you 1,500 foot of clear runway within, uh, say, an hour after a, an attack. 
So initially the Air Force specified a takeoff and landing distance of 1,500 feet. So let's see what that does. 1,500 foot for takeoff is not too bad. Uh, it's not much different from what the F-22 is actually able to do. I think it actually doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, constrain the problem. The other two constraints are more difficult. But 1,500 foot landing is far more difficult. We put 1,500 in there for the landing distance. Now suddenly the landing constraint, this vertical line, is far over to the left below 40 pounds per square foot, maybe 37 pounds per square foot. And with that supercruise constraint of 1.8 Mach, it drives you to a required thrust to weight ratio of 3 which is completely unattainable. So the Air Force had to do some thinking and that's the purpose oftentimes of constraint analysis to uh, give the customer feedback on the, the harsh realities of trying to achieve uh, the performance that they're asking for. And so the back and forth between the engineers and the customer is very important in defining realistic requirements. The Air Force finally decided was that in the event of uh, an attack on a runway with only 1,500 feet available runway, uh, that uh, portable arresting gear could be used to stop the aircraft in the required distance or in the available distance. And so it was okay to design the aircraft to just use a standard NATO runway 8,000 feet long. So if we allow 4,000 feet for landing and 4,000 feet for takeoff, that's essentially what the Air Force settled for. And uh, that takes the takeoff and landing completely out of uh, being a driver for the aircraft design point. In terms of the combat turn, the Air Force settled for a lower G-loading and in terms of supercruise, the Air Force settled for supercruising at Mach 1.5. And so now we come back to where we started with the F-22 or the YF-22 model and with our analysis showing that the YF-22 can achieve those relaxed requirements which the Air Force finally agreed to.